Okay, hi, I'm Sarah here with Graham Magazine, and we're here with Chef Sebastian Carosi, and we've done a couple videos together, Chef, haven't we? Yes, we have, and I am always excited to talk to you, your mom, and everybody at Get Graham Now or Graham Magazine. Uh, what's going on, Sarah? How are you? Well, not much. I'm excited to keep cooking and keep learning from you because you seem to have a wealth of knowledge that we would love to share with everybody. So I want to ask you. I gotta say thank you for that. <laughs> oh, it's just true. It's just true. There's no, no ego hyping here. It's just true. Um, we wanted, we've gotten to know you and we thought it was really important for our readers and our viewers to get to know you too, because you have so much knowledge to share. And a long story. Uh, <laughs> So uh, my name is uh, Chef Sebastian Carosi. Uh, my middle name is Alexander. My social security, no, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> I mean, um, I'm, better, I'm better known as the short order cannabis revolutionary. Um, and the reason why that moniker is kind of stuck to me is because uh, short order food or real food uh, with the shortest distance from farm to table without the use of any fancy techniques or ingredients or tweezers, um, artfully done, to restore the body is really what I'm looking at. And if cannabis is an agricultural cop, all the better because we can ingest our medicine through food. And uh, clean cannabis consumption through food is generally and always has been my primary focus uh, in educating people about. And how did you get started with that? Where, where did you start cooking with cannabis? So <laughs> my only father, yeah, my father was, uh, and uh, he was a medical profession, professional, and he grew cannabis um, from the time I was born all the way on. So I always, there was always a garage full of uh, a dank 70s strain. What that was, I couldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> but there was always something growing, um, and no matter where we lived. So I knew that my dad was not only a user, but he was using for reasons. So as I got older and started stealing weed from my dad, sorry, dad. Uh, I started realizing what uh, cannabis was doing. I stopped calling it weed, started calling it cannabis, um, and started realizing that my lifestyle was kind of based around it. Um, when I was younger, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and I was around uh, a lot of huge growers and geneticists in the area that I grew up in, and I um, unfortunately I got involved with some of them, and I got in trouble because the laws with cannabis were not so friendly back then. So as a 17 year old i found myself uh headed upstate on the gray goose if you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so i got a five-year vacation um it was actually a seven-year vacation i did five on seven for cannabis crimes and uh, with that said i want everybody to know that if you can jump over to the last prisoner project on any of their channels and support anything that they do um, it makes a huge difference i was somebody that went to the penitentiary for cannabis uh, and they lumped other crimes into it uh, because that's what I got caught for as a young kid, 17 year old. Um, and uh, when I got out after doing my bid, I went to work for a catering company that uh, catered exclusively for the Bush family. Uh, you know, Texas Rangers, presidents, you know, that, that family. Uh, in Kenny Bunk, Maine, um, as we all know, the Bush uh, uh, compound is uh, called Walker Point, Maine, and I lived in, in Maine at the time. So I took a job with the Bush. I passed the Secret Service clearance, even though I had done time for cannabis crimes. So for me, I was like, wow, the barrier I thought would never crumble just crumbled on a presidential level for me. I never thought I was going to get a job. When I got out, I got treated like, like shit. I'm not going to lie. Excuse my language, but I got treated bad because I was a criminal first, not a cannabis criminal. I was a criminal. So my life was kind of based around that. I wanted to be a bad boy. I was still young, but I didn't want to end up back in prison. So I can't sing. Rockstar was out of the question. I started putting some formulas together in my head, and I thought of some thoughts that I had when I was in high school uh, before I had gotten caught. And um, the world was moving in a way where I could be a banker, a chef, or a mortician, and yet still maintain a level of existence um, because everybody eats, everybody spends money, and everybody dies. Uh -huh. um, my father, being in the medical industry, I uh, had a cadaver dumped out in front of me. No, thank you. 
um, banking, the monetary system, just in my lifetime, I used to be able to go to the store with a dollar and buy this big old pile of candy or whatever I wanted, you know, for a dollar. You can't buy anything for a dollar anymore. Mm -mm. Um, so banking was out of the question. Plus I saw that it was just a kind of a lecherous usury system, the banking system for me. And I can say that because my family proudly owns two banks in Rome, Italy. Uh, so I know what they do and I know their practices. <laughs> so I cooked, I, got, I went to prison, I got out of prison for cannabis, I uh, got, uh, got out and I started cooking. I went to culinary school, which was really hard for an ex-con all yoked up and big and tattooed and to go into a culinary school where it's, you know, mostly people that are really timid and, you know, and I would be in a class, I paid $52,000 for a year of culinary school. I just want you to know that. That is more than an Ivy League school. You that have to go to culinary medical degree. school. Exactly. People don't realize that. And I had to go for four years to get a degree. You can go for two to get a certain degree in associates, or you can go to four and get, uh, um, I can't remember what it is, a uh, bachelor's or some whatever a four degree degree is, mixed business. Yeah, exactly. So I was fresh out of the uh, prison system and going to culinary school. And I, uh, it was great. I had food at my availability. And it was the biggest outlet for me, being that I was still a seven year, 17 year old trapped in a 24 year old body at the time when I got out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, cannabis was the only thing that kept me level headed enough to perform brain surgery if I needed to be a brain surgeon, to do an act as the ballerina if I needed to dance my way around the kitchen to be a farmer and a gardener if I needed to grow and produce my own foods because I wanted to be a chef, to realize what genetic modification was and what manipulation on food and a food system was, huge impact on my soul. And to see America hungry, when I grew up in an age of TV, I haven't watched TV for 15 years. Um, I have a TV, but I choose cable. I saw on TV, when you see a starving country, you see a bag of grain on, on people's shoulders and it says, product of the United States. So I see us feeding the majority of the world, but yet I see we incur a national debt. But who is that national debt for when we're feeding 85% of the world? So these thoughts start coming into my mind. So I have to become a chef because I have to feed people. Cannabis is an agricultural crop, no matter what way you look at it. You can smoke it, you can eat it, you can put it on yourself topically. The uses are endless. But bottom line is, agriculturally, it has to be grown from a seed, preferably in soil, preferably sun-grown. I know the autoflowers are a huge thing right now, and I bless every person out there growing autoflowers because they're, 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 they're beating a system that I got put in prison for, and I love that. And I'm all for it, and I support autos. And the modification that people do in a closet with the cannabis plant and a paintbrush and pollen versus in a laboratory. And there's nothing wrong with the laboratory. I'm just saying that I trust that a little bit more with my edibles. Uh, so for me, it was no brainer cooking with cannabis and a plant that had endless questions and answers at the time. When I started cooking with cannabis uh, in the early nineties, um, and I have pictures with me and Jack Hare to prove it. I put them right on my Instagram page so people know. And it's Jack Hare like terror for all those that forget. That's his name. That's how you say it. Uh, he's responsible for a lot. I met Jack three times in my lifetime. And each time he pushed me further to use cannabis in cooking. He said, you have a pulpit. You have a voice. You happen to have a very damn good one. Huge compliment to me. Um, he was right, so, you do. Thank you. So I used it and I got fired from jobs left and right because I would get a job at a, a Relais Chateau and I'm going to say their names or a select registry hotel and they're just conglomerates, they're rank hotels. And I would get a job for $85,000 a year. Sometimes I'd get $85,000 and only have to work for six months because they were a seasonal hotel. That's good money for a 24 year old kid. Uh, mm -hmm fresh out of prison, by the way. Um, so I would get these jobs, but I would get fired because they would smell cannabis on me when I came to work. And I would say, well, realistically, I 
can't function very well without the cannabis use. So your operation's not going to run. So you got a choice, either keep me or fire me. And they had to be by the book back then. So they, they had to let me go. Mm-hmm. So I got fired from jobs, Sarah, where people now, 20 years later, come onto Instagram and like my stuff and are apologetic. Sorry, we had to uphold the rules. I got fired from jobs, so many jobs. And I see things like expungement. You guys at Get Graham Now, at Graham Magazine, touch on a lot of topics. And expungement for me is a huge topic. And I'm going to divert from the food and culinary for a minute. Absolutely. Please go on. This means something dearly. They asked me for $540 to expunge my cannabis crimes off of my record. I will tell you this, and I'm as honest as possible. My closet is for clothes. When I got out of prison, I worked for a guy. We opened a restaurant in LA. I got caught with two pounds in the mail in LA and got 30 days in Los Angeles County. A year to the date after I got done doing five years in the Washington State Penitentiary, Clallam Bay, McNeil Island. I was in all those penitentiaries. Uh, It's not a brag situation. I'm just telling you. Uh, So, oh shit, a stoner and I lost my thought. Uh, So for me to see- Thank God for editing. (laughs) Yeah. So for me to see these lawyers coming in and saying, I want $540 to expunge your cannabis crime. And I'm thinking, this is 2015, 2016. I live in a legal state. If somebody turns me down from a job for a job, that's their own fault. Secondly, what is that expungement doing for me now? Oh, I, I lost your audio. Lost my job. Couldn't pay my bills then. Mm-hmm. So what's the expungement and the five hundred and forty dollars doing for me now? When 17 years ago, when I lost a job and I couldn't buy my kid new shoes for her dance class when she was four, when I couldn't feed my son because I didn't have a job, because I lost it due to cannabis, when today there are CEOs that don't even smoke cannabis sitting on a board of a company that make $28 million. I got troubles with things like that. So I sit back and I look. And I hear about the work that you guys are doing at Get Graham Now, Graham Magazine, when you're interviewing people with The Last Prisoner Project, when you're talking about incorporating cannabis into your diet to help your medicinal issues, your your health issues. That to me, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, So yeah, I got off topic a little bit. I'm totally sorry. But to me, that those points are hugely important for me to know. So, and the journey continues. I'll let you ask the next question because there's so far we can go with food and policy, people, community, and cannabis. I love talking about it. I'm ready. I mean, that was all my questions, but do you have anything that you want to talk about that we didn't? Anything that you want to dive more into? I am really excited for you guys in Florida for companies like Magical Butter that give people these, these, uh, countertop botanical extractors that are making things like butter, whether it be butter from a cow or solid at room temperature, coconut butter, mm-hmm. oil like olive oil, avocado oil, MCT oil, whether it be tinctures that are alcohol-based, lotions, that machine right there gives you the opportunity to make everything. Today, I believe, we're uh, about three quarters of the way into this year. And today you did something for the first time in your life. You took your magical butter machine and you made cannabis tincture, alcohol based. Then you took that tincture and you burned off or reduced off or evaporated off all of the alcohol. And you made RSO, Rick Simpson oil. I did, I'm gonna get it. (laughs) I'll be right back. Sarah's going to go get her syringe of Rick Simpson oil, and I'm going to let you guys know that it was one of the funnest times in my life watching her and her mom, Nancy, with the pan of RSO, Rick Simpson oil, that they created by themselves with their own two hands, 
Yeah, all using the magical butter machine and a stove on the pan. That's it. That is hugely important. So everybody in the medical industry and in the medical realm in Florida, see that? That's RSO, FECO, full extract cannabis oil. That is pure full spectrum medicine right there. I wouldn't have That's done it without the help from you. I appreciate that. You know, they made, a, they made a documentary about Rick Simpson of almost 30 years ago now. You guys should really look for that documentary and watch it because it explains everything. Rick Simpson is still alive. He's one of my heroes. Um, when we talk about people like uh, Sophie, Alexis, and these people that are kids that have debilitating uh, issues health with their health, and mm -hmm. us adults that have other debilitating issues, whether it be yeah. mentally or physically, RSO is plain and simply one of the best answers. But learning about it, learning how to use it properly, titrating your system to where you know your body, your endocannabinoid system, and the use of that product, product is hugely important. It's just like, well, if we don't roast the peppers in the soup, the soup is going to be a little bit tart, tangy, and it's going to take a little bit more energy fuel from our system to get it through our system. But we want to roast the peppers, that like the RSO. The RSO is decarboxylated in the process that it was made. And it gives you every one of those compounds available to you. I know you've probably just eaten your first dose of uh, your homemade RSO. I don't know if you remember the strain that you made it out of, but how do you feel? I, I feel good. I feel like I'm able to finally focus on what's in front of me and not worry about 500 other things that are happening right now. And living in these stressful times, it's really helpful to finally be able to focus because I had to take an incomplete in my summer class because I couldn't focus enough to get my schoolwork done. You're not the only one, Sarah. <laughs> you're, you're there with all oh, about 160 million other people. So do not feel bad in any yeah. way. And a lot of people do. A lot of people think that it's, one, it's, a, it's a deficiency in ourself. Yeah, and I'm like, what's wrong with me? Yeah, self to us is all that matters. So we're like, okay, we don't want to tell anybody. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do that. So like, we like get further into ourselves with it. When all we need to do is in Florida, medicinally, where you're at, you can head down to the shop. You can get some flour, make your own RSO. You can also buy some RSO. Um, I would look into that documentary and I would also look into the products that people use to make RSO, because I believe back in the day when Rick Simpson made his first batches, he used naphtha and we used alcohol, which yeah. I don't know if you used pure grain alcohol or I this. I used Everclear. Yeah. So believe it or not, that Everclear in itself being a dis distillate has some issues that are addressed when we're talking about medicine. I'm going to let you know. It's far beyond my thinker and some of the people that you interview and talk to further on Graham are really going to be able to shed light to both of us on a lot of these things because I don't know as much as I would like to. No, I don't either. That's, that's the best thing about learning is that it never stops and you're never going to be bored. Yeah. And just think, I mean, realistically, we're talking about cannabinoids, the endocannabis can, cannabinoid system and a plant that just 10 years ago, we realized had oh, 120 terpenes. And then the other compounds and components are in 120, 400 total, I believe. So we've got a lot of years to talk about it. The alphabet soup, as I call it, of CBD, CBG, THC, you know, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. It reminds me a lot of genetics. Um, we have the Human Genome Project, and we thought, maybe there's 100,000 genes in the human body. Well, there's not. There's some other, I think it's like 44,000 genes. But you start and you have no idea because it's all so new. In, the, in genetics, everything we know changes every three years. It doubles. It doesn't change. It doubles. Exactly. And that's what I'm finding in cannabis. We do talk about that, and we jump back to culinary cannabis for a second. Yeah. I used to put, when people would come to ask for jobs in my kitchen and wanted to work for me, you know, I asked what their interests are. 
And if they smoked weed, they automatically got a job. <laughs> if they were in con, they automatically got a job. Um, except barring those crimes that we won't speak about where I wouldn't hire them in the first place. Um, but so, so, so for me, I, I, mind medicine, body medicine, food medicine, if we can continue to keep all of those things in the same realm of thought, we're going to lose a lot of the health problems that we have, help the ones that we do have along right now. Um, I wish people would get a little bit more into, and I hope the readers, whether they be digital readers, in print readers, uh, people that are watching this on one of the webinars, I hope that they start studying and looking into not only the RSO, the buds, knowing that their cannabis is clean when they're buying it from a dispensary, that it's, that it's grown in a clean room, um, that it's tested for heavy metals, pesticides, molds, myotoxins, and residual solvents. Um, it's, it's a huge situation, and uh, there's other uh, ways that we can go about that, but hopefully a standardized situation will come where the, the government is getting their dollars now. Uh, hopefully they will help us with things like that. Hopefully they'll help regulate and make sure that we consume only clean product. That's what really I'm looking for. Because I wanted clean carrots. I was never interested in, uh, in any of the Monsanto genetically modified things. I was always interested in an heirloom strain. Because if I, as a human being, am picking up an heirloom strain, and it's heirloom because it's over 100 years old, yet it probably had to last through a couple of thousand years cycles of life before, um, I know that geneticists and people in the lab can help those seeds out to continue for tens of thousands of years. Um, craft cannabis, like craft apples and heirloom apples, and is all in the same realm of a lifestyle for me, like getting out and getting a walk, or clearing our head, getting a little sunshine, or foraging, or getting in the garden. And it's all a lifestyle that, prior to cannabis coming mainstream, uh, everybody looked at us weird we're not the weirdos no more we're mainstream we're healing ourselves and my life has been better since i've introduced cannabis into it and i just want to keep learning from you and i'm so excited with our cooking series and our upcoming our misfit box of random produce that we're saving from going to the dump so yeah, i'm so that's, excited. that's two birds with one stone to be excited about because not only are we helping the environment, helping a farmer, helping a local farmer, helping you and I eat right. Um, we're, we're just killing three and four or five birds with one stone. I hate to say it like that, but it's <laughs> birds chicken, we're good. Uh, um, a lot of people have health issues and they have a lot of dietary restrictions being in this day and age. Um, I live with somebody that I call a lactard. She's lactose intolerant. Um, mm -hmm. I have no, Sarah, you're, you're, you yourself are. So we, we're, this is what I was going to talk about is, is that we're, we've started a series kind of on GitGram now on Facebook, on Instagram, on every social media uh, platform that GitGram now and Gram Magazine has. Um, keep your eye out, folks, because we're doing a lot of things. We're cooking with a lot of ingredients that are readily available, that are new. If you talk and reach out to Get Graham Now on Instagram or Get Graham Now on any of their social platforms, you can talk to Sarah, maybe tailor something, ask her about, or ask her and Nancy about cooking a particular dish you want us to come up and do. I would be more than happy. I know Sarah would be more than happy to accommodate that. And uh, anything like that, anything that anybody, any viewers have, um, please ask the questions. Come on the platforms and ask so that we can answer questions that are real and give an answer that we feel is the real, the most real answer out there that pertains to the, the, the topic that we're talking about in the, in the, in the best way. Um, we have a lot of backgrounds to get Graham now and Graham magazine uh, pulls together a lot of people from a lot of different uh, 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 pr professional backgrounds, whether it be cannabis science, whether um, it be uh, people, you know, we got to look forward to this. We have psilocybin therapy that's going to be coming on really soon. Um, that's going to be hugely important to discuss because that is plant medicine also. And it's a huge part of our plant medicine issue coming out soon. That's another, see, the topics are running parallel. And I love that. It's like uh, we could do webinars and cooking series forever. Um, I do know that you and I have talked about doing an oven melted 
uh, heirloom tomato soup because yes. tomatoes are you know, they're in season right about now. And I know your Misfit box should have uh, some tomatoes in it. It also, I think the preview said that you're going to have some beets and some other things like that. And I haven't had beets before, so I'm excited to get to try new vegetables that are more seasonal and really get to experience new foods and enjoy food again. Sarah, you just said something that was hugely key. And if we could get a little bit, if we could get more people to jump on what you just said, eating seasonal. If we would just eat seasonal, we would be able to maintain, and I know this goes against everything I believe in, we would be able to, if we ate seasonally, we would be able to eat, maintain eating a little bit more of the crap foods that we do eat. As long as they were eaten seasonally, they would be nutritionally dense and they would be helping out everybody along that line that I was saying, i.e. the farmer, the producer, yeah. um, the nutrient level, plain and simple for you, the help that it's giving you, eating seasonally gives you the most nutrient dense product that is available in that product. If we eat a tomato that is out of season, it was ripened under non-natural circumstances, which means the nutrients are non-natural. They're just not there. Food is non-nutrient dense. Remember how, uh, well, this is great. My mom will love this. <laughs> well, I, well, I know you're gonna be watching, but my mom is like, damn, that weed you guys smoke is nothing like the weed we used to smoke back at Woodstock. And yes, she was at Woodstock. Back <laughs> at Woodstock. The weed was like, good, but, the shit you smoke nowadays is like a train wreck. And I was like, no, mom, it's not train wreck. That was purple kush. <laughs> we have train wreck and we love that. We love rainbow train wreck. <laughs> so uh, the same with the food, uh, carrots, uh, produce. If you can realistically look at um, the more heirloom strains, the more locally grown with less travel time, mm -hmm. you're not only doing yourself a favor, you're doing the world a favor. And We've got some rough times we're facing in this day and age. We're facing right now in America, racial equality. Um, we're fighting food insecurity. We're fighting, um, there's actually in other countries, swarms of locusts. There's a pandemic. This is 2020, everybody. We're in the middle of COVID-19, a pandemic. Those wasps, the, the killer hornets. <laughs> Here in Washington State, there's, they're looking for the hive now. So there's a lot of things that if you're a God-fearing person, you're paying attention right now. <laughs> a lot of black friends. I have a lot of brown friends. I have purple people eater friends. I love every single one of them equally. And for us to be able to get on here and to teach every single one of them about clean cannabis consumption through food, Man, I would stay locked up forever if we could do that and people enjoyed it. Heck yeah. I never would have done this if this weren't for the coronavirus. I, I would still be in school in Alabama. <laughs> uh, just don't say roll tide roll if you're in Alabama. No, 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 no. No, University of Auburn, okay? There you go. There That's you. why I said it because your email address is that at edu Auburn. <laughs> We're in Eagle, okay? There's no roll tide road. Roll tide. I can't even say it because it's not, it's not coming out of me. It's not supposed to come out of me, okay? Sarah, believe it or not, uh, we talk a lot about my exploits and, uh, and adventures as a culinarian. Um, I will let you know that I lived in Alabama for a, a number, almost a year. Um, I, uh, I, <laughs> I was, on purpose. Yes, I was, uh, I was educating an ostrich and emu farm on how to, uh, break down humanely ostrich and emu, uh, more in particular emu for the, uh, for the table, for the plate, for the people that you know, wanted to eat it. Uh -huh. um, in, in particular, we were, uh, I, I noted that there was no money in the meat, but the barrels of emu oil that I was selling to the cosmetic companies was making us rich. Wow. Yeah. So, but I love Alabama, some of the most beautiful beaches in the country if you can get down south in alabama by those beaches oh my goodness i will also tell you as a chef there's a couple of restaurants like the hot and hot fish club frank stitt there is some restaurants in birmingham there is some restaurants in huntsville there is just some damn good places to go in alabama and everybody thinks you know oh my goodness alabama i'm never going there it's 
may have racist connotations and notions. The people are phenomenally nice. The hospitality is beyond great. I was actually taught some of the dishes that I enjoy the most mm -hmm. by a 400 pound black lady named Miss Sue, and you did not call her anything else. Uh huh. I learned some of the most deep rooted Gola, African, Creole, Cajun, and just real Southern black soul food uh -huh. that I've ever learned from Miss Sue. And I will take all of that in my heart to my dying deathbed. Those are some of the most, remember we talked earlier, these people didn't get to hear it about James Beard and I. Uh -huh. Miss Sue was almost as dear to my heart as James Beard was. Oh, wow. Well, that soul food is my, I mean, I grew up in Florida and I go to school at, at Auburn, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you mean go? <laughs> and soul food, Southern comfort food, that is my, that is my food. But I want to learn to branch out, but I would love if we could infuse, infuse some amazing Southern soul cooking with cannabis. That's some soul healing right there. Uh, I don't know if you can see these write-ups at the back. Uh, these write-ups are, one of them is about a restaurant that I just sold about eight years ago. It was called Muddy Waters. And not because of the musician, uh -huh. but because of the brackish Muddy Waters that crawfish In and the oysters and you know what I mean? But this was, uh, you can't see it, but there's a, there's a crawfish in there. I was the first one in Washington state to get crawfish harvesters to harvest commercially for a restaurant and bring me fresh crawfish three times a week. Yum. There's a food truck that parks by the gas station by the College of Science and Math where I was at Auburn. Yep. And before lab, I would go and I'd get a pound of crawfish, crawdaddies to have before I'd go into lab. And they were so good. <laughs> you gotta do one thing before you do that. You gotta get highly medicated, then get two pounds of crawdaddies. <laughs> Next time. Well, thank you. I've had a wonderful time just overall with you, learning from you, getting to talk with you, getting to be in your presence is honestly a gift. And thank you so much for teaching I me. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the uh, uh, accolades and kind words. Uh, you and your mom have been nothing but kind to me since the day I met your mom here in Oregon um, at a very large cannabis expo. Um, and uh, your magazine, Grassroots America Magazine, just the name screamed out to me. So I uh, will do anything I can to help you, your mom, the magazine, and anybody in Florida that is in particularly looking to help cure themselves through cannabis in any way or fashion. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Yep, have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you so much. Bye.